Welcome to the Smart Connector, the podcast that helps entrepreneurs be the leader their ideal people love. Build your influence, wealth and success, attract others for all the right reasons and become a Smart Connector, the architect of your amazing business and life. This is the 100th episode of the Smart Connector podcast, and to celebrate, I wanted to interview a really special guest, and Dr. John Demartini was my number one choice. I've followed him ever since training with him in 2016, and I often discuss his work with my mentees and members of my communities. He's a leading human behaviorist, business consultant, and author of over 40 books, including my personal favorite, The Values Factor. He's founder of the Demartini Institute, which uses research-supported methodologies to facilitate human change and development in all areas. And in this capacity, he's created programs including his flagship breakthrough experience, which assists people with what he defines as the seven key areas of life, financial, social, physical, mental, spiritual, vocational, and familial He appeared in the acclaimed film on the law of attraction, The Secret, and lives and travels the world on a floating ship he calls home, the world which continually cruises to some of the most exciting destinations on earth. This is such a great interview between us and I know that you'll love it. Welcome to the 100th episode of the Smart Connector podcast. I am so happy to have reached this milestone moment. And in order to really celebrate this, I had to bring you a very special guest. And I found him. This is somebody that I have been wanting to interview for such a long time. It's the amazing Dr. John Demartini. Welcome, Dr. John. (laughs) Thank you for inviting me and having me on your show. Thank you. Dr. John and I, we we do have somewhat of a history. He probably doesn't realize this, but I have actually read quite a lot of his books. I also attended his training a few years ago. And I have to say that, Dr. John, you've actually been a really profound influence on me. I just love your book, The Values Factor. That is my favorite book of all time. And I often talk to people within my own entrepreneurial circles and and my mentees and so on about your philosophies and, and about the book itself. So I'm sure that I'm personally responsible for quite a few of your book sales. So I'd love to just start by talking about this whole issue of values, Dr. John. How did you how did you come up with this amazing philosophy, I would say, and, and kind of group of concepts? Well, I was interested since I was 18. I started teaching at age 18. I've had a dream to assist people and learn everything I can on maximizing human awareness and potential. Yes. And helping people do something extraordinary with their lives. Now, I'm not an altruist. I did it also for me because I, I learned very young that if I helped other people, it tend, it tend to help me. And if I taught other people, I tend to learn. Mm-hmm. But I had a dream to do that. And along that journey, I noticed that many people would say they wanted to do something and wouldn't do it or try to do something and it would peter out. And I was going, what's the difference? Why is it some people take action and walk their talk and other people limp their life? Mm -hmm. And it boiled down to what was intrinsically the values that they were holding. So I started exploring the values about 43 and a half years ago um, and started to research that very thoroughly. And I found out that every human being, regardless of gender, age, or culture, is living with a unique set of priorities that is like a fingerprint, a retinal pattern, a voice print, a snowflake. And this set of values, this set of priorities, this hierarchy of values, this things that are most to least important arrangement in their minds and life is dictating how they perceive, how they decide, and how they act, and therefore is impacting their destiny. I've said for years that the hierarchy of one's values is dictating their destiny. Mm. change your values, change your destiny. And they do change over time. But at any one moment, you have a hierarchy of values and it's filtering your reality and making how you make decisions and actions. So anytime you discover what your values are, you'll see that whatever's the highest on the list of values, the highest in priorities, the thing that's most important 
is what you spontaneously are inspired to do and fulfill. And what's lower on your set of values, the lower you go, the more you require extrinsic motivation and incentives to get you to act. So you'll need reward or punishment to do it or if you don't do it. <laughs> and so living by reward and punishment and extrinsic motivation is a symptom, not a solution for humanity. Mm. But living according to what's intrinsically really valuable to you is a solution. And helping people identify what they value most and structure their life accordingly is liberating. Because whenever you're doing what's highest on your value, you grow in self-worth and confidence. And whenever you do things lower in your values, you're lowering your self-worth and confidence. And you wake up your leader if you live by the highest one, and you become a follower if you live by the lower ones. So the hierarchy of one's values is crucial to know. When the Delphic Oracle said, know yourself, be yourself, love yourself, what it really meant is know what you value most, be willing to structure your life and live accordingly, be that. And you'll love your life. You'll be appreciative of your life. So I have been really pursuing and studying that. I've devoured every book that has been available on the topic that I can find around the world that's at least translated into English on the topic and summarized and synthesized it and put it up to date where, it, where people can help themselves get clear about what that really is. Because so often people, if you ask them what's important to you, what's really priority to you, What's really valuable to you? They will share with you cliches of injected values from individual authorities or collective authorities around them that they're subordinating to, that they're admiring, and they'll be not really sharing what's true for them, not what their life demonstrates, but your real life demonstrates your values. And so finding what that is is crucial to mastering life. And if you live according to the highest ones, you'll become master of destiny, not a victim of history. I just love that so much. And the first time I heard you talk about this, just literally the scales dropped from my eyes and everything fell into place. And I thought, well, I know this. I, I know this instinctively, but nobody has ever actually explained it in this way. And it just made me look at everything differently. It made me look at my life differently, my work differently, my relationships differently. It's actually very profound. But the way that you express it is very, very simple. So I think what you've done is you've synthesized maybe, as you said, you're a, a huge student as well as a writer and a teacher. So you've synthesized all of those ideas that might be perhaps too complex to bring to people and made them really, really simple and easy to understand. And that's what I just love about it. So I have a, a question for you, Dr. John. Given that it's simple to understand when you explain it this way, why do people not follow their values? Why do they subordinate themselves to another authority? They actually are following their values, uh -huh. but they're subordinating to outer authorities and expecting to do something else. And they're living in conflict. Yeah. And they self-depreciate themselves as a result of it. The reality is that anytime you run, walk in a mall, and you see somebody that you think is more intelligent than you, more achieving than you, more wealthy than you, more stable in relationships than you, more socially savvy than you, more physically attractive than you, or fit than you, or more spiritually aware, whatever that means to you, you'll automatically compare yourself to them, put them on a pedestal, minimize yourself, and then inculcate and inject some of their values into your life. And in the process of bringing their values into your life, you'll cloud the clarity of your own. Confuse yourself and try to scatter and distract yourself, trying to fit in and conform for fear of rejection and fear of not living up to the fantasy that they have a better life than you and not honor the magnificence of what your own highest value is pursuing. Because your own highest value is the teleological purpose and the most meaningful and inspiring thing you could be pursuing. Trying to live in other people's values is futility. Einstein said it really nicely. If you're a cat expecting to swim like a fish, you're going to beat yourself up. If you're a <laughs> climb a tree like a cat, you're going to beat yourself up. But if you honor yourself as you are, the magnificence of who you are is far greater than any fantasies you'll impose into yourself. Emerson said it very nicely. Envy is ignorance. Imitation is suicide. Why be second at somebody else when you can be first at being you? So identifying your key hierarchy of values 
and setting sail on the top priorities, the ABCs, not the XYZs, liberates you from the amygdala and puts you in the executive center in the driver's seat to run your life. Amazing. I just, as I said, I just, I just love that so much. So, John, you know, you are a human behaviorist. So this is something that you've, as you said, you're a lifelong student as well as a teacher and, a, and an author and so on. How do you think that your philosophies and have impacted your students as you've been working with them? Well, the ones that have really inculcated some of the principles, the proof is in the pudding. Their, their lives become more engaged, more inspired. They've learned to, to see... If an individual doesn't delegate lower priority things, they're going to devalue themselves and so will the world. Mm. Until you live by priority, you can't expect to be a leader. You can't expect to stand out. You won't be the individual. You'll be part of the herd. Mm -hmm. You won't be herd. You'll be part of the herd. Yeah. And so the individuals, the students, and I've been blessed to have a lot of students around the world. We have them in every country now. The ones that have applied it, the letters that I get, and the achievements that I get are tear jerking, tear jerking. I mean, whether they be in movie industry and be celebrities or whether they be sports figures or whether they be business people or whether they raising a family or social causes or political. I've had people from every walk of life and the ones that actually start to inculcate the principles and, and put it in operation, they see it. It's self-evident. It's so it's like common sense that's uncommonly used, but it's it. You cannot expect to excel doing low priority things. Mm -hmm. Can I share a really practical exercise that I did that changed my life when I was 27 years old in relationship to values? Can I share it? Yeah. And and whoever's listening or viewing, maybe you get a piece of paper out and, and actually create what I'm about to do because I think it could make a difference for you as much as it did for me. You get a blank piece of paper out and put five vertical lines in it with equal space, six columns. So five lines making six equal space columns. Now, I got this idea from summarizing a book called The Time Trap by Alec McKenzie. I was, it was 1982. I was 27 years old. And I'm now almost 67. So it's uh-huh. been a while. But I read this book and I summarized some of the ideas in it. And I decided to create this little format. And this little format has been a goldmine. I've shared it with people in governments and corporates and all kinds of people. But in the six columns, on the far left column, I want you to write down every single thing that you do in a day, personal and professional, not broad general things like marketing or sales. That's too broad. I I want the actual individual step-by-step action steps you're doing, filling your day. From the time you get up to the time you go to bed, what are you actually doing? If we videotaped you, what are you actually doing moment by moment through the day? Write all the actions you're taking. And don't just take one day. Imagine over a three-month period what you might do in those days and include it all. So you have a really comprehensive summary of what you actually are spending your time actually doing with your actions, with your motor functions. As you make this list, most likely you'll be reflecting, introspecting, and thinking, whoa, am I doing a lot of stuff that's not really priority? I was majoring in minors and mining or majors when I made this list. And it was a real eye-opener. And I had to be, I had to be factual. Don't write down and leave stuff out. Be really honest with yourself. In the second column, after you made this thorough list, and I divided mine into professional and personal, what I did at home versus what I did you know, at work. And sometimes I was at home doing work stuff and sometimes at work thinking of home stuff. But then what I did in the next column, column two, I wrote down how much does it produce per hour? How much does it actually make per hour? Which is a reflection of my contribution of service to other people who will be willing to pay. If somebody's not willing to pay for something, it must not be of value to them. So I asked, what's it actually producing? And I wrote down an extrapolate. So if it took two hours, I divided by half. If it took me a half hour, I multiplied by two to get an hourly amount. So we had a common denominator, hourly income. Mm. And when I did that, I saw that it was very ranging from complete zeros where I was getting paid nothing all the way to 15,000 or more an hour doing professional speaking, engaging people in coming into 
as clients. Yes. And uh, also clinical work that I was doing as a doc at the time. So I had this whole scale. And what I did is after I went down this, I saw how many things I was doing that wasn't producing a result economically. Mm -hmm. I realized I was spending a lot of my time doing something that was devaluing me. And so what I did is I reprioritized that list according to what produced the most, 15,000 an hour, down to the least, which is zero an hour, and put them there. And I looked at that and went, whoa, no wonder I'm devaluing myself and so is the world. Because I'm spending a lot of my time doing stuff that's not really most important that I didn't get trained with specialized knowledge in. And if I don't use my specialized knowledge, I'm devaluing myself. Yeah. I think it was column three. And in that column, I wrote down the meaning of each of these. Every one of those actions, what's the meaning on a one to 10 scale? How inspiring and how meaningful is that action? Is it really something I go, oh, God, I've got to do it? Or is it something I really, truly dream about, inspired about, love doing? And I reprioritized that entire list according to meaning on a one to 10 scale. And I was really blessed because some of the things that were 10 in meaning were also the things that produced the most income, which was great. Because that means I couldn't wait to get up in the morning and do it. People couldn't wait to get it. And I was tapped into the work, as Buffett would say. So I, I, I reprioritized that list and then reprioritized the two together. What was the highest production and meaning and production? So I got an idea of what I need to be targeting my energies on. In the next column, I asked, what is the cost if I was to delegate that and hire somebody to do that action to the same scale and quality as myself? Because sometimes my ego would say, well, I can do it better than that. By the time I delegated, I could have done it. And I was in my way. And that's the time trap that Mackenzie was talking about. Yeah. So I went in there and looked at what is the actual cost to hire somebody, not just their salary, because it's usually three to four times the salary, the real cost. That's the cost of their parking and the cost of the training and the cost of their space and the cost of their equipment and cost of depreciations and lost opportunities and everything, all the training costs. And I did the best I could with nitpicky penny identifications of what the costs were for me to have somebody do that action. And then I looked at the spreads between what produced the most and cost the least. And I reprioritized that list according to spreads. So I knew if I could extract surplus labor value, the most surplus labor value out of other people's actions to liberate me to do the highest productive and most meaningful things that produce the most income. The next column was how much actual time do I spend on that per day? Mm -hmm. Realistically, on an average, over those three months, what do I really spend on average per day? So I got an idea of what I'm really doing. So I can really make wise decisions. In the final column, the final prioritization of all the variables. So I then finalized prioritizing according to meaning, spread, and productivity per hour income. And when I did that, I then layered it into 10 layers because there's a lot of things I did. And yeah. I put the lowest layer that produced the most, that gave me the highest uh, spread that I'd be wise to delegate up to the top ones that produced the most that had the least spread that would be wiser for me to do. And in the process of doing it, I then started hiring people and I put job descriptions on those components. Now, when I started this at 27, I had one assistant and myself, and I was doing everything. <laughs> I was doing some of the administrative work, but even that I would step in and interfere with it. <laughs> but when I started to delegate in 18 months, 18 months, I went from one staff member to five doctors, 12 staff members, a 5,000 square foot office and wow. ten, ten fold increase in income and massively more profits because now I was able to do what I love doing that I was inspired by that took my skill and shed myself from doing the rest. Now, I never went back. This is 40 years ago. I never went back. October will be almost 40 years, 39 years. I've never gone back. I have not driven a car in nearly 32 years. I have not cooked since I was 24. Wow. I've not done administrative work. I only do what is the highest priority thing that produces the most, that's most meaningful to me, that inspires me. And that is to research, teach, travel when I'm able to travel. Now I'm doing it on Zoom and ride. And the rest of it, I delegate. I don't do anything else. I have everything delegated. Jokingly, Somebody said, well, you delegate everything? And I said, yeah. I said, I even delegate to my girlfriend, 
lovemaking. And they said, you're crazy. <laughs> I, said, I said, listen, if I went to my girlfriend and I said to her, I've got Hugh Jackman, Gerard Butler, Brad Pitt, right? Vigo Morgerson. I've got these men in here that I can have make love for you. Will you still love me if I have them make love on, on my behalf? <laughs> so far, my girlfriend said, I would love you even more. So I, I found that delegation is the key to liberation. And I'm joking about that. That was just a joke. <laughs> delegation is a, is a key to liberation. And if you're, not, if you're doing low priority things, why would the world value you? Stop and think mm -hmm. about it. Because you're, you're, if you're not valuing yourself enough with your time, because your life and time are the same, why would the world? So this liberated me, and I've never gone back since then. I don't do administrative stuff. I don't do anything else. It's automated or delegated. And I do what I love doing that I can't wait to get up in the morning to do that I'm great at, my specialty, my Ricardo's comparative advantage and competitive advantage in the world. And I stick to what builds momentum as a leader in my field that makes the biggest difference. And that I can tell if a person will do that exercise and they will apply it and do what I just shared and make sure when you delegate, you don't get somebody to delegate to that doesn't have on their highest value what you want to delegate or otherwise uh, you'll yeah. be managing and having to go back and deal with that instead of liberating yourself because they're greater at it. If you're hiring A people, you end up in an A list. You hire D people, you end up in the dungeon. Yeah, and that's a really, really good point and very uh, powerful because, as you said, if you live by that philosophy, and you know, I, I think it's it's hard for many people to be as singular about it as as you are. And I'm not saying that they shouldn't, but I think people do struggle to get to that point sometimes. But as you said, the the team that you surround yourself with, they have to have the same philosophy and values in terms of wanting to to fulfill their highest purpose as well because that makes life easy for you doesn't it well they they won't have your values because they they have a job that's different than you yeah it, see nobody goes to work for the sake of a company no they go to work to fulfill what they value most and if you as a leader of a company don't know what the people you lead's values are mm. you will probably be an autocrat a dictator a tyrant projecting your values autocratically onto them, expecting them to do it and require extrinsic motivation to reward them if they do it and punish them if they don't, which is the least effective approach to management. It's antiquated. But caring enough about humanity and humanity, meaning your own employees and your customers to articulate what is deeply meaningful and purposeful to the mission of the mission of the company in terms of people's values. And the product service idea in terms of those values is liberating to them and you because now they can't wait to go to work because they're getting their values met and you can't wait to go to work because you're liberated from doing the things of micromanaging. Yes, exactly. And sometimes their values might, well, they are going to be completely different to yours because they're individual. You don't want somebody with your values because if you do, they'd be wanting to do what you want to do. You yeah. want somebody that does the things you want to delegate. Like I, I had a lady many years ago named Bonnie. Now, Bonnie was quite of an introvert and didn't talk to people that much. Went into the office, shut her door, and knocked out every one of the insurance uh, claims. Just knocked it out of the ballpark. Didn't talk to anybody. And people said, well, she's kind of quiet. No one talks to her and everything else. Yeah, but look at her productivity. Unbelievable. Because she found that that job matches her personality. Where another good lady that was Lois that interacted with the clients and the patients and was talkative and outgoing and extroverted and had values on that. If you put her on insurance, she would have bombed. But you put her in front of the interaction with the people and she shines. So the reallocation of people according to their values and job duties, if they can't see how the job duties are helping them fulfill their values, they're not engaged, they're not inspired. Mm -hmm. But Bonnie was inspired doing that, which she was excellent at it. But she wasn't a talkative person. But why did she get work done? And so people, we don't want to project ourselves onto everybody else, expecting everybody else to be like us, when yes. that would be the twilight zone. 
Yes, exactly. Exactly. So I speak to a lot of startups, solopreneurs, they're just getting their businesses off the ground. So I know that a lot of them would love to be able to delegate their low value, low priority tasks. But a lot of them say, well, I can't afford to do it because I'm not making the money yet. Uh, What would you say to those people, Dr. John? That's why they're not making the money. Ah, yes. (laughs) It it never costs to delegate properly, Mm -hmm. but it does cost to delegate to people who aren't inspired to do the job, to free you up, to do what you do that makes the most income. Yeah. If you're not accountable to do the thing that actually closes the deals and makes the most income or whatever it is your specialty is, and you're focused on managing them instead of doing what you're there to do, and you got somebody that's not inspired to do what needs to be done and delegate Yes, it's going to cost, but it's not going to cost if you're liberated to do the thing that actually produces the most, that you are actually have the most meaning on. Because now you're free to go do what you love, and now you're, you're loving your life again. You're not burdened. So it doesn't cost to delegate. It pays. I have had many people, solopreneurs that have started up, that have come and consulted with me, and they thought, well, I, I, don't, I don't have that. My income is barely paying bills. I said, that's why. And we sit down and do that exercise. And they go, whoa, I'm spending 80% of my time doing the stuff that produces the 20% results instead of the 20% of my time that gives me 80% of the results. Joseph Duran, when he wrote the Pareto Principle from Velveeta Pareto, yeah. he mentioned that, but people don't listen to that. But if you actually find that one thing that you're excellent at, that is the thing that you are greatest at, and stick yeah. to that one thing, you're going to go farther than if you try to do multitasking and trying to save money. Remember, the poor people try to do all. They repair their garage. They repair their car. They do everything. The car's in the garage, outside, yep. sitting on the You know, this is what happens when you try to be somebody that's scattered. But if you focus and do a specialty and hire a specialist, the standard of the socioeconomic position you play in goes up. Yes. You know, even if you have no money, like you had no money at all, if you find somebody that has values that match with yours, then they will want to do it so badly that they will want to come and do it in partnership and create something with you, won't they? Yeah, the thing is, I'm going to make a statement here, and this is going to hurt, but it's, it's needed, I think. Okay. If you're poor, it's because you don't care about humanity. I'm, I'm just going to state it. I said this at a church one time, and the whole place just went quiet. <laughs> and I said, because if you're focusing on your own problems, and you're not caring about solving problems. If you don't fill your day with challenges that inspire you, that make a difference in people's lives, you're going to fill up your day with challenges that don't inspire you, that hold you back. Care enough about human beings to find out what their needs are and directly or indirectly find a solution to those needs. And you will be more fulfilled. You will be more remunerated and you'll have the cash to delegate. It's that simple. But you have to put them as you have to put them as, as a high value enough to go and serve people, because the people I know that are focused on it. There's a great video by Jeff Bezos talking about Sony, and if they haven't gone on and looked up Jeff Bezos dash Sony, little video. Okay. Because what he's doing is that they realize that the guy that headed up Sony was dedicated to changing an entire culture of a country when he started Sony. It wasn't about his company. He had a bigger vision about humanity and about the Japanese culture. That's what led to one of the biggest companies in the world, Sony. Wow. So Bezos took that same principle and it made it customer focused. That's why he's the wealthiest man in the world. So if you're not wealthy, well-being, wellness, wheel, health, it's because you're not focused on what's the priority in a business. The business is to be of service and to have a sustainable, fair exchange with equanimity and equity and make sure that you have it's sustainable that way and caring enough. So you have to care about your customer and find out what their highest values are, their dominant buying motive, if you want to get finances. And then there's no problem delegating. Yeah, I love that. I love that. That's absolutely amazing, Dr. John. But as you said, sometimes you will say something like that and, and people will not receive it well, that there is some controversy around some of your uh, philosophies. So some people would say to you, for example, well, what about all those people in third world countries, or, well, developing countries like Africa, where they don't necessarily have the choice 
that that we have? Is it really their fault that they're poor? So what would you say to that? Well, I would love to say that because I do a lot of business in Africa. I have an office in, in uh, South Africa, in fact. I'll share a story. Mm-hmm. I was speaking at the uh, Sheraton Arabella Hotel near the Cape Town waterfront. If anybody's been to Cape Town, they'll know where this is. <clears throat> and about 800 people. This is about probably 12 years ago now. 800 people. And it was on personal finance and about personal wealth building mm-hmm. that you can make a difference. Now, there are people of all different financial positions in that, in that class. Because it was just an evening class. It was a moderate price. It was just an evening intro. Way in the back of the class was a young boy who's 14 years old. I didn't get to meet him then, but he was there. That was September, about 12 years ago, maybe 13 years now. I came back in December and I did another presentation about 800 people at the same place. But this time at the very end of my talk, as I was signing books and taking pictures and answering questions in a line, for over an hour and 45 minutes, that line went. At the very end was a young boy, 14 years old, that came and waited and waited and waited to the very end. When he finally approached me at the end, when I'm about to close up and be finished, he said, Dr. Martini, you inspired me. And I said, fantastic. How so? He said, you inspired me to think differently about money. And now I've started to save. And I said, fantastic. And then he said, Dr. Martini." My father and mother both died of AIDS. I have nine brothers and sisters. I'm the oldest and I'm 14. I live in a shack in Kailicha, which is a township outside near the, towards the airport. We live in a little shack that is literally 10 foot by 10 foot. Oh. And we cram into the shack and there's no floor, it's mud, but we put stuff that we find on the floor. When it rains, we have to put plastic on top of the place. Mm. There's no electricity. There's no water. But there's a kind of a bathroom nearby. And there's a water fountain nearby, water pump. Dr. DiMartini, you inspired me. And I made a commitment that I was going to save a portion of my income. Now, I make 60 cents a day. Stacking mud bricks at a brick company and they bake in the sun and I stack them. And when they do, I stack them in properly to be sold. They pay me 60 cents a day because I'm underage, but I still work. I have to take care of my brothers and sisters. 15 cents a day goes to a woman to educate my brothers and sisters and to take care of them during the day. 15 cents is now saved. Now, 15 cents, at that time, it was 6.7 rands to the dollar. Now it's about 18 or 15 or something. But I'm converting it back into dollars. Yeah. He, I, he said, I save 15 cents a day, and I have saved the rest of the 60 cents, which is 30 cents. I pay for everything in the house and the, everything we live on. Yeah. 30 cents a day. And he said to me, I've saved $7.50 U.S., since September. My dream is one year from now, December, for Christmas, to put a $20 down deposit on a $200 shack that has electrical light bulb, a cement floor, quality brand new corrugated steel that's closer to water and the bathrooms. And I'm going to get the house for my family. He said, By then, I should have at least $30 saved. 20 will be down. And I'm going to keep saving. And I'm doing what you said. I'm keep asking for what else can I do to serve? What else can I do to serve the company? What else can I do? And that helped me get a little bit more income and more hours. Now, one year from then. It's moving me to tears, actually, listening to it. It really is moving. One year later, I got a picture with him in front of that house. Now, he had a dream, he said. My dream, 
because there's a lot of kids in this township exactly like me that don't have parents anymore. It says, my job and my dream is to inspire a thousand kids to do the same. So I'm trying to pass everything you taught me on to new to the new kids. Oh. So one thing I'm certain about is it's not what what where you start, what you're going through, what you've been through, or what you experience that matters. It's your perceptions, decisions, and actions of those things. I'm not saying it's easy. I could have easily given him two hundred dollars or given him more and bought him a house. But if I did, I would have robbed him of his own dignity, accountability, responsibility, and productivity, and the feeling of accomplishment and mission that he had. Now, he's not in that position today. He's a viable individual that's no longer living in a township. Wow. So it's not the circumstances necessarily what holds us back. There's always somebody that starts like that and does something extraordinary. Yes. But... There's no doubt that there's probabilities are lower, but that doesn't mean that you have to be a statistic. You could be the odd in the statistic by taking command of your destiny. Yes. So this boy inspired me as much as I think I inspired him. Oh, yeah. yeah. The story that you've just told, that's really inspired me as well. That's so moving. That's just, oh, thank you so much for sharing that. Amazing. And of course, Dr. John, when... When you told your story, because I spent a weekend with you, you had a challenging start in life as well, didn't you? I, I'd love you to share some of your own story with, with our viewers and listeners as well. Well, when I was born, I was born in 1954, November 25th, Thanksgiving Day. When I came out, I didn't realize it. I was not aware of it. My parents weren't aware of it. But my arm and leg was turned in. I mean, they just thought it was just the way I was sitting. But when I finally got to about nine or 10 months, and I started to try to walk. I kept falling over. And I found out that my leg, I had pigeon foot. My leg was rotated in. My hip and right leg were rotated in. Mm-hmm. And my arm was rotated in. So I had to wear braces on my arm and leg from about a year and a half to age four. Mm-hmm. And kind of like a forced gump thing. And, and, you know, with kids in the neighborhood, they don't know what to do with you. And they kind of They don't know what to do and how to handle it. And they reject it and stuff. So it's a very awkward situation. But when I got four, I, I wanted to get my, I wanted to get out of those things. And I wanted to run. I want to be able to play and run like everybody else. And so my, I I begged my dad to let me out of them. And I promised to keep my arm and leg straight. And then I used to go down to the corner, 13 houses down the street and wait for my dad to turn the corner with his car coming home from work. And then race him to prove that I could keep my arm and leg straight and made sure I kept my arm and leg straight. And I ended up becoming one of the fastest runners in the neighborhood once I got out of the race. When I got to elementary school, I ended up having a problem in first grade. I found out, and oh, by the way, I, at a year and a half old, I also found out I had speech impediment and I go to a speech pathologist. I couldn't pronounce and use my mouth properly. I remember wearing strings and buttons in my mouth and do these muscle exercises. When I got to first grade and they tried to put me in reading class, it didn't work. No matter what I did, I just couldn't comprehend, read, pronounce, spell properly. And I wrote backwards. Uh, so I had to wear a dunce cap with a guy named Daryl Dalrymple. Uh, and uh, the teacher said that I'm afraid, she pulled my parents to the school and said, I'm afraid your son's never going to be able to read or write, never communicate effectively, probably won't go very far, not amount to much. If I were you, I would put him into sports because he likes running. So I got into sports. And the only way I made it through elementary school is by befriending the smartest kids and asking them and walking home with them and asking them questions. As long as they would tell me stuff, some of it would stick. And I made it through elementary school just enough until 12. And by the time I turned 12, my parents moved from Houston, Texas to Richmond, Texas in a low socioeconomic area where there were no smart kids and a lot of racial issues. Mm -hmm. And then I ended up failing. And so I dropped out of school and I became a street kid at age 13. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I lived in a park and I lived in a bowling alley that was open 24 hours, lived in a diner, lived at friends' houses, you know, lived in a car. I lived in, you know, whatever it is. And by 14, I ended up uh, hitchhiking to California 
and down into Mexico to go surfing because I was actually decent at surfing, but Texas wasn't the surf capital. No. <laughs> California and Hawaii is where I wanted to go. So I eventually at 15, I went to Hawaii and I first lived under a bridge there, the Sunset Bridge at Kamehameha Highway, and then lived in Iakai Beach Park under a park bench, which is still there because last year I went surfing there and it's still there. Wow. I showed my daughter and I had her, we sat on that bench where I used to sleep. And then in a bathroom when it rained, and then in an abandoned car, and finally in a tent that I acquired. And so I kept social climbing into a tent environment <laughs> until I nearly died one day. And I ended up being unconscious for three and a half days. Yes. In the recovery of that, a lady found me in my tent and led me to a health food store, which led me to a yoga class, which led me to hear a lecture by a gentleman named Paul C. Bragg. And that one hour lecture or 50 minute lecture that this man gave changed the course of my life. He said that we have a body, we have a mind and we have a soul and the body must be directed by the mind and mind must be guided by the soul to maximize human awareness and potential. And that we have to set goals for ourselves, our family, our community, our city, our state and our nation and our world and beyond for 100 to 120 years. It says that what we think about, what we visualize, what we affirm, what we feel about, and what we take actions on becomes our destiny. And nobody ever talked to me like this. No. Nobody ever said that. And that night was the first night in my life that I thought, wow, I really would love to be intelligent. I never thought I would be. I really thought, wow. I would like to be intelligent, learn how to read, and, and, and be able to speak properly. And that night, I had a dream and a vision, which is painted and sits in my office today, of me speaking in front of a million people, sharing a message. It was sort of a, probably a dissociative identity disorder at the time. <laughs> <laughs> but I saw a vision to do that. And I started studying with this man every single morning for three weeks and learned everything I could from him. And then I went on my journey and I flew back to California, hitchhiked back to Texas and tried to go back and take a GED and try to go back to school. And I failed at first. And the day I failed my first class, I almost gave up on my dream. And my mom caught me crying on the living room floor. And she said, son, what happened? What's wrong? I said, mom, I guess I don't have what it takes. I'll guess. Aww. I'll never read, write, or communicate, never mount a thing, never go very far in life. Oh. I guess this whole dream was a fantasy of being educated. And she said something that only a mom could say. She said, son, whether you become a great teacher and healer and philosopher and travel the world like you dream, whether you return to Hawaii and ride giant waves, which I did, or return to the street and panhandle as a bum, I just want to let you know that your father and I are going to love you no matter what you do. Aww. And in that moment, that unconditional loving moment. My hand went into a fist. I looked up and I saw my vision. And I said to myself, I'm going to master this thing called reading and studying and learning. I'm going to master this thing called teaching and healing and philosophy. And I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to travel whatever distance, pay whatever price to give my service of love across this planet. And I got up and I hugged my mom and I went in my room. I got a dictionary out and I started memorizing 30 words a day in a dictionary. With the help of my mom, I grew my vocabulary strong enough to where I could finally understand words. And I started to read and I excelled and I just never stopped. I started putting 18 to 20 hours a day in reading. I've now read over 30,520 something books. Ooh. And I just love learning and I love sharing. And my teaching career started at 18 because as I was learning to read faster, people started asking me questions and I started giving what I was learning. And I never stopped the teaching process. So today I've been blessed to teach in 154 countries. I've, oh. I've got to reach millions, in fact, billions of people. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm a firm believer. It doesn't matter what you've been through. What matters is do you have a dream and are you willing to do whatever it takes to fulfill it? Oh. That's where the values come in. That's why you want to stick to high values. 
Yeah. Oh, I love it so much. You know, hearing you speak, it's just, it's like poetry. It's incredible. And and as you said, you've poured all of that stuff into your mind, all of that good stuff, all, all of that incredible wisdom and all of that effort that other people have put into, into their books and their thinking. And it's very, very inspiring. I mean, you have an incredibly inspiring story as well as movement and a cause and everything. So, that's been really so so inspirational to hear that. And you love travel, don't you, Dr. John? I remember that. That's something else that we talked about. And I remember when you did talk about it, you said, well, this came from being so restricted as a, as a young person. But tell us about your travel and all about all the different countries that you've visited and why travel is such an important part of your of your own personal values what it means to you to travel well when i was three my parents used to let me play in the yard and they said yeah you got to stay within this boundary of the yard you can't go outside the yard but whenever they weren't looking i would take off sometimes i would go climbing down into the sewers and run through the sewers as a little kid and they couldn't find me they didn't know what to do by the time I was uh, nine, dad saw that I wasn't going to do well in school. And so he wanted to make me street smart. He tried to train me in how to be a little entrepreneur in some respects. It made me accountable. I, about nine, I was having to pay $7.50 a week to live at the house to pay for food, clothing, and rent, which oh. I'm very grateful for. Because he, he said, I want you to know the real world. This is the real world. It takes money to do it. So I would have to do work around the neighborhood to, in order to make the money to do it. And he would charge me rent for the equipment that I would use. Oh. But then I bought a bicycle with the money I earned. <clears throat> and my dad said, okay, you can go anywhere as long as you're home by, by nine o'clock at night. So I would ride my bicycle 35 miles into different towns and areas around Houston and different directions just to explore and learn how to use maps and so by the time I was nine, I was, I was riding 35 miles. By the time I was 12, I was hopping trains to different cities. Really? By the time I was 13, I was hitchhiking to different cities. And 14, I was ready to hitchhike to California and Mexico. Wow. So I was traveling at a young age, and I liked the freedom of spirit. I'm a triple Sagittarian, as they say. Sagittarian <laughs> like freedom. And uh, I'm not a homebody guy. I'm not a cancer or a home person, but I'm more of a wander. So I love traveling and I feel at home. I, I, when I was 18 and I came back home, I went to my mom and I said, mom, what, you know, cause this gentleman, Paul Bragg told me every single day, I told him I couldn't read. He said, say this every day that I'm a genius and I apply my wisdom. So I said this statement every day and I asked my mom, what exactly is a genius? I didn't know what it was really. <laughs> was people like Albert Einstein and Da Vinci. I said, well then get me everything that I can get to read on those guys. And I, I found out that Einstein said, I'm not a man of my community, not a man of my family, not a man of my community, not a man of my city or state or a nation. I'm a citizen of the world. And Epictetus, when he talked about Socrates, said, I'm not a man of Corinth. I'm not a man of Athens. I'm a citizen of the universe. And I always put that in front of me and always imagine that and always imagine myself being that the universe is my playground. The world is my home and every country is a room in the house. And every city is a platform to share my heart and soul. So today, my residence is a ship called the world. And it literally goes around the world to every country that allows water to, to, to sail to. And I've been living on there for 20 years. So I'm actually living on a ship called the world that goes to every country. And so I really believe that that matched my vision and my dream for how I wanted to live my life. Yeah. What an amazing experience that must be. And but so unusual, isn't it? Because a lot of people they like to put down roots and they like to have a neighborhood and they like to have somewhere that they identify with as their home. So I guess a lot of what you do is very singular to you, isn't it? It's what matters to you. But what an amazing experience that must have been to just be traveling around the world and then coming home to this ship and to never know where that ship's going to be, because that's what what it's like, isn't it, to be on on that ship? Well, you get a, you get an itinerary. We set the itinerary. We decide it's our ship. Yeah. I'm the owner, <clears throat> so I just said, where do I want to go? And we go. But the value of it is, you you know, what a great year we had today. It's an adventure. 
Yes. And you get to meet people from all cultures, from all walks of life that are doing amazing things. And I like that. I, I, I like to think of it as that I'm not a local tribal thinker. I'm yes. more of a global astronomical thinker. Yes, I would definitely say say that that's true. <laughs> yeah. So h- how has lockdown and COVID affected you, John? Has it, has that been challenging for you in any way, or has it just uh, represented another opportunity? How how do you see it? Well, I'm a firm believer that it's never what happens to you; it's what you decide to perceive it as. Mm-hmm. So I immediately I flew in. I was filming a movie and doing the breakthrough experience in Tokyo. Yeah. I flew to Los Angeles. Monday. Got there Monday afternoon, late. Tuesday, they announced that you're not allowed to have more than 20 people in a room. And we had an event coming up with 200 people on Wednesday. Mm. So we had to shut that down. I went online Wednesday night, went online over the weekend because we had another program on the weekend, canceled 20 programs in 20 major cities and went online with all of them. I had a few, you know, that didn't show up, but a whole bunch of new ones that did. And now I've started to reach people from countries I wasn't able to reach. We had people from Madagascar and Mongolia and places that we're, we weren't normally reaching. And so I'm now Zooming around the world instead of flying around the world temporarily. And so as far as I'm concerned, I'm still reaching. And I, and I love watching people from different parts of the world. The other day we did a seminar. We had 37 countries people from 37 countries on. Wow, 37. Yeah, so I, 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 I'm I, grateful. And of course, when we do podcasts and clubhouses and things, they're from all over the world. So I'm getting to travel while I'm waiting to travel. So I don't, I don't feel like I've missed out on anything. And it's actually lowered the cost, made it more efficient, allowed me to reach more people. Yeah. And I've had more time with my kids because I've been in Houston and where my kids are. And I've had, uh, and it, it just been, I've gotten to work out more and do more research because I'm not having a lot of downtime traveling. So I will continue to travel once I get back on the road. Yes. I, I figure that no matter what happens to you, there's always a blessing. Yes. Find the other side of it. If you're if you think there's a setback, there's always a step forward to balance it. Well, absolutely. And that is something that I have taken with me for many years since I did your training is that everything exists in balance. And that is something that you talk about a lot, that for every downside, there's an upside. And and I often think about that. I really do think about it a lot because everything that happens, it just means that you're you're never feeling like a victim, right? There's no reason to be a victim of history when you could be a master of destiny. You know, when you're infatuated with somebody, you're conscious of the upsides and unconscious of the downsides. Mm -hmm. You're ignoring the downsides. When you're resentful to something, somebody... You're conscious of the downsides and unconscious of the upsides. You're ignoring the upsides. Yes. Your ignorance of ignoring one of those sides is what's now put you in the amygdala, and now you're impulsively seeking or instinctively avoiding things, and the world extrinsically is running you instead of you balancing it intuitively by asking questions that make you aware of what you're ignoring. Yes. See both sides, become mindful, and then run your own life. So I just run my own life. I don't let the world on the outside run me. That's why delegation is so crucial. Yes. Oh, well, Dr. John, what can I say? You have created the most incredible value, not just for my audience today, but also for me personally, again. So I just wanted to thank you so much for your wisdom and experience and for joining us on this 100th episode, milestone episode. And I wish you a wonderful, a wonderful year. So thank you very much again for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Smart Connector podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, why not head over to janebaylor.com and order a copy of my free report on building your personal brand. I'd love to connect with you on social media. And finally, don't forget to like and subscribe to my podcast so that you never miss a show. Thanks for listening in and see you soon.